Good morning. I'm going to read from um, 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God he has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Dear God, please etch these words in our hearts, our minds, our souls. Please let us know that your love for us must be expressed in our love for others. May the message that we're going to hear today through Scott be a message that convicts our hearts and puts us on a new path. And in that I pray. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate you. Well, good morning, church. Good to be with you. How's everyone feeling? Yeah, all right. I hear uh, a rumbling. Is there a Tyler, Texas representation here today? Give it up for Tyler, Texas. I have family in Tyler. I got family in Al uh, Athens, Texas, Malakoff, Texas, Waxahachie, Arlington, Grand Prairie. Go Cowboys! <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Well, Tyler, Taylor, uh, Tyler Texas contingency, welcome to, uh, to uh, Chandler, to Coffee uh, and Jesus, Sozo Coffee and Missio Day Church. Glad you guys are here today. Uh, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. And good to sing with you guys. Great to, to worship through music. Now we get to worship through the word. And I'm going to tell you right now, when we sing and we worship God through music and there's a little guitar solo in there, it helps me worship even more. Give it up for worshiping with guitar solos. Come on. Give it up, buddy. Miguel. Man, so good. So good. So this week, my wife and I had date day. Give it up for date day. <laughs> Word to the wise, a $30 lunch with your wife is a lot cheaper than a $150 counseling session. Can I, can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> date days are the way to go. So we're hanging out eating tacos for date day because that's what cool couples do right so we're uh we're eating tacos and we're eating chips and salsa and i love chips and salsa greatest food group ever invented thank you lord so i'm eating chips and salsa and i'm going to give you a little sneak peek into our date day so you know we're always coming to the table ready to talk about how are we doing in our marriage how are we doing with kids blah 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 so the, one of the topics this past week here's the topic on date day cancel culture okay you guys from i can tell a few of you are like ooh, that stings a little bit if you don't know what cancel culture is it's basically uh the point you come to when it comes to maybe your your digital citizenship and your like or dislike of others the moment they disagree with you or the moment they think differently than you do you go ahead and cancel them unfriend them stop following them we live in a culture where the moment you disagree with me th is the moment we end our relationship. Cancel culture. So Lori and I were talking about this over lunch because she unfollowed me and she unfriended me. No, no, just kidding, she didn't. 
you're canceling me, girl. What's going on? No. We're just talking about how, like, how can we be different as believers in Jesus in our world? Because uh, one thing I do know the church is, is slowly moving into, it's, it's following the ways of the world and following this counselor, cancel culture mentality. And we of all people who claim the name of Jesus ought not to be involved in cancel culture. But here's what I do believe God espouses is compassion culture. Matter of fact, write that word down, compassion. Because compassion is not based upon those who like the things you like. Compassion is not based upon people agreeing with you on every subject. Because here's, you all, we all have BFFs. Who, who's got BFFs in their life or besties, right? Like one of my BFFs, where, where's Gunther at? Gunther, he's out smoking or something out there. Okay, so, <laughs> so, you know, Gunther and I are BFFs, right? But here's the thing, even as you have besties and BFFs in life, you don't agree on everything. There is no one in the world that believes exactly the same things you do to the nth degree. And we have to realize that that's okay. That's okay that people look like us and think differently than us and wear different clothes than us and, and vote differently than us and listen to different music than us, right? This is what makes us community and makes our community so rich is the, is the act of compassion that I can show you even if you believe differently or think differently. And so today there's a lesson from Jesus for us all that we, we live in a world that, again, is becoming more and more tribalized. And how you sort through the tribes, I don't know. But all I know is we need to arrive at a little bit more sim simple way of living with one another. And, and, it, and I think it begins with us, the church. That we need to be more compassionate than canceling. That we need to be more listening. We need to be paying more attention. All I know is that the, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, do good to everyone. And I don't see like a little asterisk in, in the footnotes, saying, except those. <laughs> it says do good to all. And when the Bible says all, it means all, and that's all all means. Do good to everybody. So God wants to create a different culture in and through his people. And so we come to a familiar passage in Luke 10, which is the, the Good Samaritan. And, and I, you know, I've taught through the, the scriptures and I've caught, taught through these passages and I'm like, Lord, help me see this with some, some new eyes, with a fresh perspective. Lord, what, what would you have us learn from the, from the good Samaritan? And, and it's interesting because it's, it's probably the second greatest question. The first greatest question is this, that you have to answer is, who is Jesus? We've talked about that in weeks past. There's that vertical question of who is Jesus? In light of who is Jesus, there's a great horizontal question that now pervades our lives, and it's this. Who is my neighbor? How do I love my neighbor? In light of how I've been loved by God, how do I love others? That's the question we're going to answer today. Because if we don't continue to ask the question, what kind of neighbor am I? How do I love my neighbor it will come as a great cost, not just to the church, not just to the reputation of the church, as if the, repu if, as if the church needs to, <laughs> we need to be concerned about our reputation, but more importantly, the, the spirit of Jesus and the kingdom of God. If we don't learn to be more neighborly, it comes at a great eternal cost. Because is it not the kindness of God that has led us to repentance, according to Romans chapter 2? How does our kindness to the world around us help people know Jesus? Because if we don't embrace the things we're going to talk about today, it's going to come at a great cost. And a cost that is detrimental. A cost that is something that I personally, who love the church, or I, also, I wouldn't work for the church, wouldn't be pleading with you today. So there are nine proverbs we're going to look at today. These are Scott Morganisms, and I know Morganism sounds weird, like I'm going to get in and creep in your lives, right? Nine Proverbs I've come up with that we're going to quickly go through that I believe are going to help us be more compassionate people. If we, if we weigh the cost and weigh the importance of what Jesus presents to us today, I believe that we will no longer settle for a stagnant, lifeless faith, faith which ultimately in the end is not worth it, but it's going to make an impact for time and eternity. Because what we do, in the words of Maximus, go gladiator! What we do echoes for all eternity. 
So let's look at the passage. Look at, let's look at the nine Proverbs. And I, and I promise I won't keep you past dinner, okay? So Tyler, represent. Dinner, barbecue, something, right? Go Cowboys. All right, here we go. Luke 10, verse 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? He answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Sounds like Mr. Rogers creeping in there, doesn't it? (laughs) Won't you be my neighbor? Jesus replies and says, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among the robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down that road And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite who was also coming down that road came to the place, saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on the journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. Circle the word compassion. So moved by compassion, right? Verse 34, he came to him, bandaged him, put oil, wine on him, put him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, took care of him. Six things he does right there in verse 34. And on the next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, said, take care of them. Whatever you spend beyond what I've given you, I'm going to repay you when I come back. Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy, circle the word mercy, toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Nine Proverbs, first one being this. It is always more costly. It's always more detrimental to us to love sacrifice than it is to live obediently. See, notice the the lawyer, which at the first mention of lawyer, we should all be like, ooh, Right? Lawyers, you know, as much as we love like thrillers, like lawyer legal type books, like John Grisham or movies, right? You know, think of like a few good men, you can't handle the truth. Right? We're always like, ooh, the law, legalities, right? So lawyer stands up and we know his question is not asked with a pure motive, right? Because he wants to test Jesus. He wants to trap Jesus. So he wants to get into this theological debate. What do I do teacher to inherit eternal life he's trying to chap jesus because jesus is bringing this message of grace and kindness and mercy and compassion right it doesn't sync with what the jews are teaching the people so jesus comes and upsets the system so he he thinks he has jesus in a trap can i just tell you right now you'll never trap jesus he is the master of getting out of traps and and reworking the situation where all of a sudden now you know it's on you and this is what he does with the lawyer See, the lawyer prides himself in in sacrifice, obedience with the mind, but he's not living it out obediently. See, it's one thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to do the will of God. This is what Jesus is getting at. Teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers a question with a question. Some of you were taught never to do this. This is like a master Socratic method right here. What does the law say? What have you read? And notice how quickly the lawyer rattles it off. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. See how quick that was? Just rolls right off the tongue. Because every Jewish man and woman, boy, girl, is taught that verse because that's the Shema of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6. They love that verse, that concept so much, they wore it on their wrists in what we call phylacteries. These little leather boxes where you open it up and there's like a little verse rolled up in there. It's kind of like a fortune cookie for for Jewish people. You know, wear it on your wrist, wear it on your forehead. What are you wearing today? I'm wearing phylacteries with God's word on it, right? You could wear phylacteries on every part of your body, but if it hasn't sunk into your heart, it doesn't mean anything. See, the lawyer's probably impressing everyone listening that he didn't even have to open his little phylactery. 
He goes, I know what the law says. The law says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself. And then Jesus embarrasses this guy. So now go do it, implying he's not living it out. Because it is always easier to be religious, to have this devotion, than to actually live it out in our daily experiences. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. Actually, I should ask, can I get an ouch from anybody? <laughs> it's not what you know. It's what you, what you do with what you know. Right? D Jesus is not getting into a little theological scrapping with this lawyer. The lawyer's going to lose, and, and Jesus could demolish this guy right here, right now. But he chooses not to because he wants to turn this lesson into an opportunity to reach his heart. You cannot substitute knowing God's word and think you can go ahead and reject his will. Which brings us to the second proverb. It's always more costly to do what? To self-justify than it is to live God-justified. We sang a song this morning, Almighty King, and you know what I love is that there's that part in the song that says, by the blood of Jesus, he justifies us, he sanctifies us. Here's the thing, we all need help in our lives. We can't do it ourselves. This is the message, message of the word from Genesis to Revelation. Everything in between is this, this idea that according to the law, none of us are able to keep God's law perfectly. And, and this was the intention of the law. The Bible says, as much as we want to be like, post the Ten Commandments, right? We need to bring back the Ten Commandments. I'm sitting there going, hold on. You don't know what you're asking for. Because the commandments, the law, is a constant reminder that we don't measure up. Back to date day. What were we eating for food? Trivia question. Tacos. Tacos. Good job. Free coffee for this person right here. What's your name? Abby. Abby. Free coffee for Abby. Are you from Tyler? All right. Best coffee you'll ever have. All right. Here we go, Abby. So we're eating tacos at this place called the Taco Guild. Anyone ever been to the Taco Guild, 7th Street and Osborne? Yeah, because none of you go down to that high rent district called 7th Street and Osborne, do you? Well, you need to go to the Taco Guild. Taco Guild is this old Methodist church. It used to be a church, now it's a taco bar. But they left the stained glass up all around the taco bar. So I took a picture during date lunch of the stained glass, one stained glass in particular where there's a table underneath the stained glass where you could sit, but it was mysteriously empty. You want to know why? Because there's a verse on the stained glass above that table in the Taco Guild that used to be an old Methodist church. And here's what the stained glass said on it. And if you guys can see it, we got the picture somewhere. There it is. Look at this. You guys can't read it. You have to have really, really good vision. You must be perfect. Matthew chapter 5. Now imagine you're going out to date lunch with your wife, BFF, bestie, whoever. And you get the table right under the stained glass. Now there's this reminder. The sun's coming right through. Accentuate, accentuating the words. You must be perfect. What a haunting thing that's going to ruin your lunch. Because you already know you've fallen short of what, that, what God wants. But even if we take out the stained glass and change it, let's change it to another great verse. God helps those who help themselves. Not biblical. Scratch that one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. How about that? No, that's not biblical either. Here's the thing. As much as we want to remove the stained glass, the idea of us being perfect is emblazoned upon every one of our hearts. And we go through life guilty. We go through life judged. judged. We go through life condemned. We go through life shamed because we know what God's requirements are, and that's perfection, and we know we all fall far short of that. So talk about ruining my lunch. Actually, I didn't because I was there with the best girl in the world, my wife. And we have come to understand that God does not expect me to perfect be, be perfect because he knows I can't do it by myself. This is why we don't need self-justification. We need God-justification. Only he can justify you, and guess what? He does. This is why Jesus came in, fully God, took on human form, dwelt among us in our messiness, says, I'm going to live perfectly, obey the law to the perfect point of being your substitute. Now all you need to do is believe. Take what I am earning for you. Let me settle the accounts. I'm going to take your sin, bear it upon myself, and I'm going to give you my righteousness. Henceforth, now being the perfect representation for us. And when you come to know Jesus, here's what happens to self-justification. 
I don't have to justify myself. This is what the lawyer is going to try to do. This is what everyone without Jesus tries to do. Because when you self-justify, you try to redefine God's word. You try to redefine God's law. See, as if the question of what do I do to inherit eternal life is not enough. Now, the, now the, he wants to continue to scrap with Jesus and says, now who's my neighbor? Let's scrutinize this. Because we are masters at trying to make whatever the base minimum is to be accepted by God. And the problem is this. We could, it's Jesus and there's no other minimum. Self-justification is not the answer. This man understands he cannot obey the law perfectly. That's why he wants to define things, scrutinize things. Here's the good news. When you understand God has stepped into your place, now you are free to love, show compassion, and you don't do it as a means of earning acceptance. You do it as a reflection that you're already accepted. And I heard the church say what? Amen. See, your compassion is a response to what you've received from God and not the cause of him accepting you. When you understand that God loves you freely and unconditionally and he has given you the perfection that you can never attain but Jesus does it for you, you can now live as a response to the great gift of eternal life and now show others compassion and you no longer have to justify yourself. You are free to love. Which brings us to point number three. Proverb number three. It is always more costly to discuss abstract ideas than to solve concrete problems. So let's talk about this. He wants to define the term neighbor. Don't we do that? God, what is sin really? What is holiness? What is purity? What? And we want to like just suck the life right out of what God says because we're so busy scrutinizing. We dwell in abstract, but God wants us to go get concrete. Abstract ideas is theological. Concrete ideas is practical. See, here's what God wants us to embrace. He doesn't want us to embrace this, this complex and philosophical debate about what a neighbor is. Because in the lawyer's mind, a neighbor was another fellow Jew. That's how they define neighbor. Someone else who believes the same things I do, they're my neighbor, everyone is out. And so they live this bifurcated, compartmentalized life that says, here are my neighbors, here are my non-neighbors. And all I know is that the word of God says this, do good to everyone. Don't you dare play games with God and try to define the terms. Because God is not into the complex and philosophical, he's into the simple and practical. I was listening to NPR Radio this past week, don't judge me. Not the bastion of conservatism, but NPR has actually revealed a lot to me about the world we live in. Some of you are like, I have over NPR the, word, the let number 666 on my radio. <laughs> Here's the problem. You need to sometimes listen to alternate views. Would you agree with that? Sometimes you need to listen to opposing standpoints, all right? So, so I listen to NPR, and um, yesterday there's a show on called It Takes a Minute. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, okay. Guy named Sam Sanders hosts it, black man. He's got a guy on yesterday interviewing him named Larry Wilmore. Two black gentlemen. Larry M L Wilmore is a comedian. He was actually on an episode of The Office where they came in to talk about discrimination. And if you remember, it was a very cringeworthy episode, right? So Larry Wilmore is this comedian who's on the show with Sam Sanders, two black men talking, and I'm listening because that's what we need to do, especially when it comes to the topic of racism. Would, has anyone heard that racism is a major talking point today? Okay, I'm just curious. So I'm going to be listening as a non-black, I'm a white guy, who I'm curious, what are they going to talk about? And what I appreciated and what kept me listening was, was the honesty that these two men are exchanging with one another. So they're on talking about current cultural, the current cultural state of racism. What really perked my attention and got me continuing to listen is the fact that they said, you know, this whole Black Lives Matter. You guys, you guys heard of this? Okay. They both said, we agree with the statement, but we don't associate with the organization. It was interesting, they both said, neither of us was invited to the table when it came to that conversation. 
as black men, we feel like there are things being defined that we're not a part of the conversation. Sam then said, now there's a new title for black people out there, and it's BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color. So that's what now what black people, Sam's like, I wasn't part of that conversation either. And then they went into the, the meat of it, and this is the best part. They both, in this almost exasperated tone, on radio said, the left is notorious for pushing so many people into a corner where they celebrate nuance over clarity. Clarity. Simple. Things get done. Operative. These two men are saying, that's what we want. Celebrating nuance is never coming to define the terms, never coming to agreement and just arguing until we're blue in the face. And then Sam Sanders says this, I am just a black man and I am tired. And boy, my heart just, we live in a world that just wants to live in these abstract ideas and shove people into categories and corners and define you as this and define me as that. And what I hear these men talking about, and again, I don't agree with everything these guys believe, but at that one moment, I'm hearing this man say, let's stop dwelling in the world of the nuance and just get back to clarity, simplicity. Let's not make this complex. Let's make this practical. And Jesus, I just think, would, if he was listening to that radio, would say, Amen. Amen, because we don't do anything good in the conversation when we're trying to always ask questions and always trying to change the questions. Because here's what we're notorious of, and I'm going to just call the church out right now. We always ask the wrong questions. We always ask the wrong questions, and Jesus is always looking to change the question. This is what, it's, he does it masterfully throughout the scriptures, right? We are always asking the wrong question. Why? Because we want to minimize what's required of us, where we are able to get by with the bare minimum of what God requires at little risk to us, and therefore self-justify. I'm going to tell you right now, the gospel is a risky gospel. The call to discipleship is a risky call. And if you think you're going to get out of this with no skin in the game, you're wrong. So Jesus changes the question. Don't we ask the wrong question? Let me give you an example. Because we, we always, we're looking for excuses. Anyone ever try to find a loophole in the Bible when it came to something? Just raise your hand. Hi, my name's Scott. I try to find loopholes in the Bible. Okay. We're always looking for a way out. Meaning, Jesus, what's the most, least amount of love I can show someone and still be saved? Wrong question. Jesus, what's the least amount of money I can give to the church and still have somewhat of a good reputation? Jesus loves changing the question, right? The question has never been, how much do I give? Jesus changes and says, how much do you keep? That's the right question. See, we ask the question, how many times do I have to forgive that person? Jesus says, wrong question. How many times do you have to keep forgiving? When do you stop forgiving? You don't. Here's the question at the table. Who's my neighbor? Wrong question. Jesus is not going to answer that question because that's not a relevant question. Here's the right question. How can I become the kind of neighbor who disregards status when it comes to showing compassion? Whew. See, he grounds the way we think about neighbors in our identity, not theirs. Do, do, do you get this? He doesn't want to finagle, wrestle, scrap with you over like defining terms. He just wants you to be the kind of person that shows compassion. Regardless of status, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of skin color, regardless of political as associations. The question is not what kind of person do I love, but what kind of person am I? What matters first and what always matters when it comes to the gospel, what kind of person am I? Proverb number, where are we at? Four? 
Guys, we got 16 of these. No, just kidding. <laughs> Proverbs 4. It is always more costly to maintain religious institutions than it is to improve neighborhoods. Okay, verse 30. So let me give you a little historical, context, uh, cultural con- context here. Jerusalem, Jericho. 17-mile pathway, verse 30, that descends 3,000 plus feet. Jerusalem, temple, religious activity. 17 miles downhill to Jericho. This is home. These are the suburbs. This is where we live. This is where we love God, serve God. This is where we hang out with our family down here. 17-mile journey known as the Bloody Way. You guys ever been to a place, I-17, called Bloody Basin? Yeah, these are really weird named things, right? Like bloody basin, like what happened there? I don't know. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to find out the bloody way. You know why it's called the bloody way? Rocky, craggy, dirty, rocky, uh, boulders the size. Bandits would hide behind the rocks. If you were traveling alone, you knew you were in danger. They'd jump out. They'd leave you for dead, rob you, strip you. Notorious. Years and years and years, people know this as the bloody way. Don't go on the bloody way. Sounds like a British thing, doesn't it? Oh, don't go the bloody way, but my... <laughs> I know, horrible, horrible impression of an English person. I'm Welsh, I can go ahead and butcher it, I'm okay, all right? So, but the bloody way, here's my question. How come no one thought of cleaning up the neighborhood and, and making it the unbloody way? Let's move some rocks, let's pave this thing, let's make it nice. But how long has the church existed in communities where we're so consumed with building better buildings and monuments to our own successes and ignoring the needs all around us. Church in California called Crystal Cathedral. Anyone ever been there? It's, it's, like, a, it's like a museum now. It's like a, it's a place where they do tours, right? There's a guy named Robert Schuler who pastored it, right? It's, it's, it's all glass. Someone got a hold of one of their annual budgets and the amount they spent on the Christmas pageant one year Five million dollars just on a Christmas pageant, and the amount they gave to help homeless ministries in the Garden Grove area, the distance between those amounts was embarrassing. And people called the church to task. You're paying for llamas and flying camels. I'm, I'm only thinking about this, out, but when you make a camel fly, that's not cheap. And you are, you, are, you are baby Jesus, whatever, eight pound, six ounce, golden fleece diaper Jesus, right? Five million dollars, and you're giving your community in which you exist paltry amounts of money. We're going to call you out. When I was first saved as a 15-year-old, we went as a youth group to inner city Phoenix, at that time, the worst neighborhood in Phoenix. Anyone ever been in Phoenix a long time? 24th Street and Broadway. On that corner is a place called Keys Market. It's no longer there. You want to know why? I was part of the demolition crew. I didn't know anything about, you know, loving the neighbor or being compassionate. All I knew is like, hey, you love Jesus? Here's a sledgehammer. Go to town, right? So I was like, yes! We destroyed Keys Market. And there were a group of businessmen, Christian businessmen, who stood up and not only bought the property, but built training facilities so that the community can get an education and be trained in vocations. And that corner, the worst corner in Phoenix, became not the worst corner in Phoenix. Why? Because Christians showed concern. We need to stop building edifices to our glory and our successes. And we need to start showing compassion and care for those that are clothless, foodless, jobless, godless. We may be a little coffee house church in Chandler, but you know what? We're making waves, you guys. I can't help but just mention once again that we as a church culture embody the the sentiment less for us more for others 
We want to be the people that when we hear of need, we want to act on it. And we've got, I've got men and women out there that are the eyes and ears, not only of the church, but of Jesus. And they're saying, there's need right now. Can we go out and buy hundreds of dollars worth of bra and panties for some women that can't afford bras, bras and panties? I go, amen, let's do it. Give it up for bras and panties. <laughs> there was a woman who came to us and she says, I have hundreds of women who have no clean undergarments. Can you as a church? And I'm like, you bet. Now, I would have, it would have been curious to be a part of picking out the bras and panties myself. <laughs> like, can you imagine me like going up to like cash register like, <laughs> 300 bras, 300 panties, here we go. But we gave that woman gift cards to Target so she can go out with the women themselves and buy all the th stuff they needed. Another woman calls me and says, we're doing ministry downtown Phoenix. We got a lot of women who, they're Hispanic, they're single moms. They don't even have shampoo. They don't even have deodorant. I was going to say, you know, good, because the bra and panty expense of our, our budget, it's all, it's all spent. <laughs> no, just kidding. So you know what I did? I, go ahead, I went ahead and ordered hundreds of sticks of deodorant and hundreds of bottles of shampoo. She comes home one day. She literally took a picture of her patio. Amazon. People are thinking, how long is the Amazon driver going to be out there? He was just unloading, unloading, unloading. What's in there? Deodorant and, and shampoo. Why? So women can wash their hair and smell good. And now I've got organizations calling out to us. They're literally hounding us, saying, We've got Christmas coming up. We've got families who are fostering kids and they can't afford to buy these foster kids Christmas presents. Will you help provide Christmas gifts for your kids? Am I going to sit back and go, no, you're, you're on your own? Of course not. We will be a church that says we will buy whatever gifts are needed so those kids know the joy of Christmas. Why? Because you guys are a part of what we're doing here. Thank you. Thank you. I need to share this because I, I'm giddy and I want to share my giddiness with others. Right? I'm, a, I'm sitting here talking to these organizations. You need to know you are making an impact. And the more that God allows us to receive, the more we're going to find the joy in giving. And all God's people said, all right, we're halfway done. Here we go. Let's keep going. Number five. Yeah, thank you. Can I, can I let me stop because I can't pass it up. I, I have a quote. It's not C.S. Lewis. I know some of you are bummed. I have this love affair with C.S. Lewis, if you don't know. But here's C.S. Lewis's bestie, BFF, G.K. Chesterton. He's like the Catholic version of Lewis. They were contemporaries. Chesterton wrote two books that I think are worth noting. One's called Orthodoxy. The other one's called Heretics. This one's from Heretics. And here's the premise, and I want you to stop on the first, first line. We make our friends, we make our enemies, but God makes our next door neighbor. Stop and just think about this. You choose your friends, you even choose your enemies, but God chooses your neighbor. You have no say in this. And of course, the scripture is now going to put an incredible premium on how well you treat the people you don't choose that are in your life. The old scripture language showed us so sharp a wisdom that when they spoke, not only one's duty towards humanity, but one's duty towards one's neighbor. The duty towards humanity may often take the form of some choice, which is personal or even pleasurable, but we have to love our neighbor because he is there. A much more alarming reason for a much more serious operation. He is the sample of humanity which is actually given us. Wow. I will tell you the distinguishing mark of any church is how well that church loves its neighbor. The distinguishing mark of any Christian is how well that Christian loves their neighbor. Proverb number five. It is always costly, more costly to show neglect than it is to show concern. It is an incredible detriment to our lives when we continue to deliberately avoid the need around us. And that's what happens. So the priest first comes out and so you loved, Jesus is, I, I believe Jesus is telling of an actual event. He doesn't call it a parable. He doesn't call it a story. I think this is an event that actually happened that's probably fresh on everyone's mind. So Jesus is recalling it to memory. And he says, a priest came down the road, saw the person in need, and went by the other side, deliberately avoiding the person hurt. The Levite says, came down the road, and then verse 32 says something unique about the Levite. The Levite actually came 
up to the person to look to see if that person was even alive. And when they took a closer look, they still avoided and went to the other side and left the scene. And then you're thinking Jesus is going to make the hero of a story just maybe like a normal Jewish man. But he doesn't. He picks a Samaritan. Can I tell how wicked this is in the, in the Jewish man's mindset? The lawyer's going, oh, how dare you pick a Samaritan to be the hero of the story? But he has to. Because Jesus is getting into to the, the heart of people that are different from us, that are opposite than us, that don't look like us, who don't believe the same way we believe. And he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. Because why? The religious professionals didn't do what they should have done. The priest, being coming from Jerusalem, has just, he's just got done serving in the temple. It's like if we left church today, knowing the message is still on our minds and saw need around us and deliberately avoided it. Here's what I know. If the Spirit of God is working, I think there are going to be restaurants in our area that are going to be full of you housing and, and hosting homeless people. I'm just putting that out there. Should we call McDonald's and get them ready? I mean, think about it. And not just today, maybe tomorrow. Maybe, to, maybe you forego your four-shot cinnamon toast latte oh, that Sozo Coffee offers, and you say, I'm going to spend that money to, to feed someone who needs a meal. I'll tell you what, if you do that, I will comp your coffee for you. Did I just say that out loud? Is this being recorded? Okay. <laughs> but these men, the priest, just got done doing his religious duty, ignores need, goes home. The Levite takes even a closer look, coming from his religious duty, is going home, ignores the need. The one that you thought least likely to help, helps. And doesn't just help, he helps. It is a lot more costly for your soul, for your spirit, for your love for God to show neglect than it is to show concern. What kind of person walks by someone dying on the side of the road? What kind of person ignores that kind of need? What kind of person are you? Jesus is not concerned about the condition of the person injured. He's concerned about the heart of the person that ignores that kind of need. James chapter 2. James says this, that you are to show compassion and concern because this reveals something about your your heart. We're dealing with Apple products, guys. I'm sorry. You just kind of, this is why we don't do Apple around here. All right, here we go. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed or lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warm and be filled, basically the equivalent of, you know what, I'll pray for you. B.S. Am I allowed to say that? That's how, we, sorry, Texas crew, that's how we do it in Arizona, all right? This is the Wild West, so BS to that. And you don't give them the things they need for their body? What good is that? So faith without works is dead. Is James not enough? How about John? First John chapter 3. I thought you never ask. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against them, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Can I get an amen from somebody? You guys realize right now California is on fire? There's a, there's a lot of hurting lives going on. I shared with you last week about my friends in Oregon whose house burned down. Well, in California, there's a church in Santa Cruz. So I was born just over the mountains in Los Gatos been to Santa Cruz many times. I have an uncle who lives in Santa Cruz, grows marijuana. Another story for another time. <laughs> but all of a sudden, these people are losing their homes, and they're getting out with barely the, the clothes on their back. NPR this week. NPR. Interviewing a pastor from Santa Cruz Baptist Church who says, our church has become a refuge for everyone who ha no longer has a home. We are sheltering them. Our sanctuary has become this field of tents and cots and beds. And, and the pastor says, me and my associate, kind of like me and Ryan, give it up, A-team. Yes! 
not going home but sleeping at the church with these people, alternating nights where they're being, being available for, for families, waking up every morning and providing breakfast for everybody. Turning the church into what it's supposed to be, not a country club where we all wear the same thing, dress alike, know the secret handshake and all that, but we all are engaged in this thing called humanity where we have needs and no longer is the church seen as a country club, it's now a hospital. And the pastor is not sitting at the door going, are you an official member of this church? Let me see where your name is on the roster. Not saying, oh, you're not Christian, you're Muslim? I'm sorry, there's no room for you here. Oh, you identify as queer, lesbian, gay? I'm sorry, there's no room. No, no, if you have a pulse and you have need, guess what, come in. And the church has become a refuge and a hospital. But not everyone's gonna come to us. Sometimes we come upon the need. And the question is, will you show concern or will you continue to show neglect? This is on me, this is on you. These are, these are, these are, you guys realize when I prepare a message, it it goes through me first and I wrestle. I wish I could come to you just this morning and be like, here's the lesson today, God is great, God is good, let us thank you for this food, amen. All right, let's get out of here. Chips and salsa. (laughs) Proverbs number Six? We're almost done, you guys. It's always more costly to make excuses than it is to take responsibility. I believe when it comes to showing need, there are no excuses you can come up with where you can justify yourself. Think about it. We don't know why the priest, the Levite, passed. They made up some excuse to show neglect and concern. So according to, to my time, I'm like, well, what, could ex- what excuse could they come up with? What excuse have I come up with? Can I share a little bit of my heart with you? Here are the excuses I come up with. Let's see if you can identify. And by mentioning them, can you just say, you're not alone, Scott? Now, if I get to the end of this list and no one says anything, I'm going to feel like a real dork. <laughs> Maybe it was because I've had a long week and I'm tired. Okay, good. How about maybe it's because the victim maybe be, is used as bait and if I help, it's a risk to me and something else could happen that might harm me. Too risky? How about this? Maybe, maybe if I associate with someone who might be dead, it's going to render me impure or unclean. I can't, I, I'm a heterosexual man. I can't talk to a homosexual man or else I might be rendered unclean. How about this? Maybe that I won't get thank or appreciated for the help I show this person. Is anyone watching? Maybe my motives are wrong. Maybe I want to be applauded by people instead of uh, uh, applauded by God. How about this one? Maybe he won't come to my church after I help him because there's a strings attached relationship that says if I help you, guess where you need to be on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock or 1045 for the hangover crowd. If I help you, will you go to my church? There's a condition. Okay, thank you. For some reason, I hear my bestie and I just, we're, we're agreeing on everything. <laughs> How about this one? Maybe he's the wrong skin color. Maybe he's a different political party. Maybe he's a def- different sexual orientation. Maybe there's discrimination in me. How about this? Maybe I don't have enough money to properly care. Because here's what I really like to do. I like to set him up in a, in, a, in a hotel for a week and provide all his meals, but I don't have that much. But I do have enough to p- at least provide a meal. Maybe buy some socks, underwear at Target. I hear they're out of women's bras and panties, but... but <laughs> Stop making excuses. Just do something. Do something. All I know is the only safe way to live. Just do something. God is honored in even the smallest act of compassion. Do you know this? Don't shoot for the moon when you can only go across the street. Do something. Number seven, it is always, I think it's seven, six, I don't know. It is always more costly to hoard possessions than to help people. Tag, tags onto the last proverb. Can I just tell you, full stop, here we go, statement. 
compassion is always costly. Compassion is always costly. Think about what this man does. Six things, verse 34, he's moved with compassion, he approaches, he assists, he pours oil, wine, I think probably on the man's wounds. If I was the injured man, I'd be like, can you put a little bit in my mouth, right? It's like, let's make this an easier experience. Puts him on his, on his donkey, he's walking, this man gets a ride into town, goes to the inn, puts him up in a nice place, pays for his full expenses, days worth of expenses, and then follows up. <laughs> hey, if it costs any more, I'm gonna foot the bill. He went above and beyond. Why? Because this man understood that I need to love those who hate me. I need to lo love those who look different than me, to believe different than me. Can I just tell you right now, if one thing COVID has made apparent, people are hurting. Suicide rates, up. Depression, up. Domestic violence, up. Sexual trafficking of children, up. It is exposing the worst in us. Praise God, we know a remedy. Amen? Praise God that we don't go through COVID as those who have no hope. If we're listening to our neighbors, we can, we're going to be able to hear the heartache and the heartbreak. And say, I don't know how to deal with your marriage right now, and I don't know how to deal with your, your depression, but all I know is this. Jesus loves unconditionally. Can I, can I tell you a little bit about him? Question number, proverb number eight. So the question is this. It's not, <laughs> who's my neighbor? It's always more costly to ask that question than it is to ask, what kind of neighbor am I? Full circle. Which of these proved to be the man's neighbor? The lawyer, still not grasping the implications, can only say, the one who showed him mercy. Can't even identify, can't even say the Samaritan. That's how hard this lawyer's heart is. The one who showed mercy. And I think Jesus is probably sitting there shaking his head like... Has, has Jesus ever shaken his head at you? He does it to me all the time. Because Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. We can no longer put the responsibility on somebody else. Essentially, you know what Jesus says? You need to become a new kind of person. The person that seeks after a compassionate heart. Go get a compassionate heart. Learn to care and show compassion to someone other than yourself. Go show mercy. And when you show mercy, mercy needs no reasons. Matter of fact, write that down. That's good. Mercy needs no reasons. And then I wouldn't be able to, to, to do a proper, proper treatment of this topic this morning without closing with this point. Proverb number nine. It's always more costly to establish a new rule than it is to experience a new reality. Here's what I'm not telling you guys this morning. Put a compassion rule in place in your life. Rules don't get you anywhere. Matter of fact, they lead to deadness. Here's what Jesus is offering, a new reality. This is, what, what, this is the gospel. You guys ready for this? Write gospel down. Last notes on your, on, your, on your outline. Gospel. Could it be that Jesus tells this account because he less wants us to identify with the good Samaritan and he wants us to more identify with the injured person laying half dead by the side of the road? And Jesus himself turns out to be the most unlikely hero in the story who is the ultimate good Samaritan who, may I remind you, is on his way to the cross as he's talking to this lawyer. And could it be that we who are dead in our trespasses and sins who have been left on the side of the road dead, uncared for by the world because the world doesn't care for us as human beings and the good Samaritan Jesus comes down the road fully clean, 
fully pure, fully merciful, fully compassionate, and sees us in our dead state and says, I'm going to help you because you can't help yourself. And not only am I going to help you and show you an incredible amounts of love and grace and kindness and mercy, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to bandage your wounds, and I'm going to pay the cost for your full healing to be experienced. And henceforth, we have the gospel. Which now says, if you have experienced the love of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, Jesus himself, and you know what it was like to be left dead on the side of the road, to be uncared for by the world, and yet the one who knows everything about you still chooses to care for you, heal you, cleanse you, pay the cost for you to be well, how do you then not become a merciful, gracious, compassionate person? And all God's people said, An unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. An unkind Christian is an oxymoron. An unmerciful Christian is an oxymoron. An ungracious person is an uh, Christian is an oxymoron. Do I need to continue? If you have received mercy, go be merciful. If you have been accepted, you go accept. If you have been shown grace, go go show grace because the true test on what you say you believe is going to be proved out in how you behave belief affects behavior and all god's people said "Woo! did i yell at you guys too much i'm sorry but all i know is that this world needs needs something better from the church and, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself as much, as much as I'm preaching to you. Does Tyler, Texas need this kind of message? Okay, yeah. yeah. Tyler, thanks for being here today. Go YWAM! Go YWAM. <laughs> Tyler, Texas! <laughs> family! I have family there! <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you know that? Did I tell you guys I have family? In Ty- yeah. Tyler, Athens, Malakoff, Wa- Waxahachie. I lived in Duncanville for a little bit. Go Duncanville. Oh, oh. Church, I love you. I'm praying for you. Let's go and love all people in the name of Jesus. Let's stand. Let's pray. I think my wife and I need another date lunch today. Don't you guys think? (laughs) No, just kidding. I love her. So. Hey. You can take the boy out of Texas. You can't take Texas out of the boy. (laughs) Love you. Father, thanks for today. Thank you for this community. Thank you for family. Thank you for for brothers and sisters from from our neighborhood and from those from afar. Thank you that there's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one salvation. There's one message and one Lord under which all men and women may be saved, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for moving upon our hearts, for showing us incredible kindness and grace. Now compel us to live in a manner worthy of that calling with a world that is desperate to hear the message of Jesus. Thank you for showering us with such love Thank you for today where we can be reminded of the important things. You are truly awesome, God. And we're only able to say thank you and pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.